Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Common Unity Podcast. It's been quite some time since I've posted an episode and the reason is because I've been playing a lot of poker recently and for you poker players out there, you know just how much volume and attention and focus you need to have in order to get any decent results in this game. So excuse my absence from social media and uh, you know doing my podcasting, um, but yeah, that's it's what I've been doing and it's been going quite well actually, which I'm very happy about given that uh, last year I had a pretty significant break where I was um, distracted by health uh, issues and everything. So very happy to get back into it. Very happy to have some success again, which is great. Uh, I wanted to bring on to the podcast a very special person who I've come across this year in poker, uh, who also shares a very similar attitude and mindset to me with regards to putting that attention into our peak performance, uh, our mindset, and our just our drive when it comes to focusing the mind on um, performing at its highest level and optimizing our experience in poker and other realms as well. So I couldn't help but get him onto the podcast today to have a decent chat with me about what it is like for him. His name is Mike Maddox. Uh, he's a fantastic poker player, a fantastic guy. And I would imagine, I haven't had a session with him myself, but I'd imagine he's a fantastic coach as well, just with the way he thinks, the way he talks, and the way he approaches uh, both life and poker. So today you're going to hear, hear him and I talk about some really cool experiences that we both had because we both had some recent success as well. So we talk about the journey, we talk about um, some challenges we come across, we've talked about a, a significant hand that we played against each other actually, which was quite interesting because we, we competed against each other. Uh, and we really break down some just um, raw feelings, some raw uh, strategies that we both use to overcome uh, difficult situations and challenges. Uh, and also just talking about, uh, we also talk about just common things that most of our clients uh, struggle with when they come to us and seek some guidance. So I hope you guys get a whole bunch of gems out of this episode. Mike has an absolute plethora of information and gems in his little brain there. So I was really excited to get him on here. So I'll leave it at that guys and I'll let him do the rest of the, uh, of the guidance here in this episode, but enjoy the episode. If you want to contact Mike or myself for further coaching or training, you know where to find us. So uh, I'll leave it to you guys. So let's go straight to the call with Mike. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, did, did you want to start out by telling us a little bit about, I guess, who you are, where you came from and what it is you are doing in poker? Sure. Yeah. Great. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, love to do a little bit of a podcast every now and then, no stranger to uh, camera or microphones. So any extra chance that we get to be in the spotlight, I think I'll take it, <laughs> but also just to kind of spread a bit more awareness around mindset, mental health, performance, uh, helping people, you know, pick up the pieces in their lives and just putting them back together to, to build, rebuild themselves. Really. That's, that's huge. So yeah, thanks for having me. I know you've got a, a great head on your shoulders with um, all the work that you've been doing for a lot longer than I have. So happy to work together and create a podcast out of this one. So um, I'm for those people who are listening, who don't know, um, Canadian import into the Australian landscape by way of uh, a work visa back seven years ago, um, was involved in um, sales in a software capacity, doing an international sales role for the, the entirety of my stay here. And um, kind of just always thought there was something more to, to life than, than to selling trucking software, which is what I was doing. <laughs> I don't know how many people get passionate about something like that, but um, my passion started to die as uh, it was just a money servicing job. And over time, I just started to gravitate more and more towards um, wanting to feel fulfilled and wanting to help people more and more. And it really started pushing me towards um, just becoming a coach. I discovered NLP. Uh, I discovered um, a few other, I guess, more modalities, hypnosis. And um, I started studying those. And just with those kind of skill sets, it gave me some tools that I could use that I could then just help people, um, which it, it sounds weird when you say it that way. But just as you take a regular conversation with a good friend, you can just start helping strangers um, and building connections with those people. And so for me, that was that was really important. And I just started to explore that further and further. And it kind of blended itself with um, with my poker playing again. Now, when I came over here for um, moving from Canada, I didn't have much of a community. 
So I kind of immediately fell back on what I knew, which was the poker table. So I went to Crown Casino. I moved to Melbourne. So I was always playing poker at Crown Casino, spent a good portion of my time, you know, in whatever kind of community you can call cash games at the casino and kind of explored that for a little while. And that was good. It gave me a bit of a homey feeling. And then I didn't really play. I, if you look at my hand and mob results, I don't really have any results from 2014 onwards because I just yes, didn't I play. had a bit of a sneak peek. I was stalking you. I, I was going to bring <laughs> that up. You kind of were there and then you disappeared and now you're back. So yeah, and there just wasn't a lot of drive for me to play poker. Um, it was just a way to kill time back then. Um, I had spent back in my early 20s, three and a half years as a pro. Um, I, I paid my way through college before that for two years. So it, it was a, probably a good five-year period where I was playing at a high level. Um, but it was just never something that I wanted to do long-term professionally after having done it earlier. Mm-hmm. And then fast forward now to where we are January of this year, um, actually October of last year, I ended up losing my job to COVID being that I was 80% travel. Um, we weren't traveling. So the business shut down and that was the end of my role, which kind of forced me down the path of, all right, you know, let's, let's do what I tell my clients to do and let's jump in head first, two feet, uh, you know, just expect that you're going to land on the other side. And I went kind of full-time into, into coaching. And that's when I took that NLP course. Um, and, and I guess the rest is kind of history. Then it was results from January playing poker with no plan of where that was going to lead me. I had uh, a flight booked to move home in February that got canceled. So I played the March series that one. I had a good score there as well. I think I, I finished second in the grind in the first series, uh, basically won like 50 grand in the first APT series, which was just amazing. And then the yeah. next series, I finished fourth in the Goliath and just kept stacking these results on top of each other. And now I guess a lot of things have just lined up for me today. And um, I guess the important thing for me is that it's, it's created a foundation where I'm using the spotlight to be able to help people and to attract more clients and to just instill the principles that I know that have worked for me so well into um, other people's games now and, and other people's lives. Mm. Yeah. One thing that I think like uh, attracts me the most to you. Um, and I say that in the most heterosexual way, of course, is the <laughs> fact that, you know, you've got this like innate, um, you know, pull or calling, if you will, to want to actually, um, you know, express yourself by helping others with the skills you've learned um, and the skills you will learn because it's sort of like a, you know, you're, you're a student of life now, like with, with everything you want to learn so that then you can help someone else also do the same thing, right. And, and achieve their goals and jump head first, as you say. Um, And so I really like that, you know, like you've got, there's these two sides to you. And it's really interesting with poker that I've found that when you're on the poker table, it's like, you're out for blood, man. Like you want to like take everyone's chips and you want them to suffer during, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) and you want to win the tournament and hold, hold the trophy at the end. Right. But then when you're off the table, um, you know, like it's completely different. It's like, okay, how can I help other people? How can I share what I know um, that's worked for me and, and everything to be able to help them? Um, and, you know, things like with NLP, which is for those who don't know, neuro linguistic programming, which is a base of like kind of like hypnotherapy. Right. So we're looking at how we're changing literally the neurons in our brain. Right. So that they can fire and wire together to then be able to create behavior change um, and impulse control and all that stuff. So one thing that really, yeah, that that really um, stands out for me. And so I'm kind of curious, like so you had this period where you really weren't motivated to play poker. And then you got another job, I think, later on, and then you lost your job. And then now you're back in it. Like, what is it that like has formed those waves? Like, what would you nail it down to? I mean, there's always just a passion when you sit down at the poker table, right? You reinvigorated with the competitiveness. And when you're kind of ticking on all cylinders with the mental stimulation and I guess trying to find some physical stimulation outside of poker, Um, But just when you're, yeah, when everything's clicking, it's, it's one of the purest sports or games that there is in terms of competitiveness. And it just, there's nothing like getting a result, right? Like if you're at a final table with who cares if it's live stream or not, if there's a five figure payday up top, it's, it's enticing. And it's one of the coolest feelings that you can have those all ins for a coin flip are just madness. 
Yeah. And so those kinds of thrills and then coming out on the other side and winning and besting a field of doesn't matter how many people it's um, it's an incredible feeling and it's just a rush that you continue to chase. And I think it's not necessarily for the money or for the glory. It's just to compete mm. and to, to just keep pushing yourself to be better. And I, I just love that part of the game so much. And I think, yeah, I guess it, you lose it from time to time because you're not having the right results or it's just, you know, not something that you want to focus all your, your time and energy into. Maybe you get into a relationship and that's where all your time gets invested into or work takes up 80% of your life. And now that has to be where it goes to. But at the end of the day, you got to find some balance. And with losing my job, it gave me more time and more balance to, to lean towards and lean into poker. And mm. so we just, we just did. <laughs> it was yeah. great. Yeah. Nice. Like, and I, I love your attitude towards it and, and, you know, that, that real winners mentality. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a difficult thing too, right? Because if you've got this humanitarian heart, it also really like, it's tough because when you win, it means someone has to lose. And the bigger your win is the bigger someone else's loss probably is. Uh, it's not always the case in tournaments because obviously the person who comes second still gets a significant payout as well, <laughs> but there's still so much on the line. And it's like half of you is like, yeah, I'm so stoked to win. But then the ha other half is like, oh, I kind of feel bad for this person because like he had a chip lead on me and then I took it off him. And, you know, so like I do feel bad for some people these days when I'm playing. I never used to feel this when I was younger. Like, and when I say that I am still young, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, like nowadays, like sometimes I might win like a significant hand that was for, you know, in a high equity situation and I can see the pain on the other person's face and it does hurt, but I have to remind myself that it's just a card game, you know, and, and if they're not prepared to be losing at the card game, it's almost like they need to go through the pain that they feel to be taught themselves for their journey. Um, but I guess like my passion, and I would imagine this would be similar to you with coaching is well, you can prepare people as best you can with, with passed on wisdom from thousands of years, really, of how to optimize your life and how to put yourself on the line safely, um, but also, you know, like to achieve the most, but also protect and make sure it doesn't crush you if it doesn't go right and everything like that. Mm. So I'm interested. So given that this year has been such a great um, year for you and you really got back into it with full swing with poker, um, what would you say like the three key skills um, and they could be psychological or they could be fundamental with poker. But what would you say the, the top three skills that have got you this um, momentum back? That is a great question. Um, if I think back to my earlier results, um, the, the second place finish in the grind really stands out to me. Now, I wasn't bankrolled at all for this tournament. And it's a $1,200 buy-in event. And I had been fortunate enough. I think I was really um, short on funds at that time, as many poker players go through the ups and downs. And I was just keen on going and playing the Omaha events, just the small stakes Omaha events, and maybe a couple others, maybe the main event. And that was it. Um, but I had said for weeks leading up that I was going to win the Omaha event. And that was it. That was the one thing I wanted to do. And, you know, so what I had to buy in five times <laughs> to do it, I was, um, you know, selling action to some of my friends along the way, but, uh, I think the, when we talk about certain things like manifestation, like for me, manifestation is so integral to not just in poker, but my everyday life and visualizing how I'm going to feel and look at the end of it just helps, helps the universe um, or God or source or whatever you want to call this higher power that we're all entangled by, it helps that to realign everything that's in that path leading up to that moment in that event. And if you start visualizing and starting to call this event in from the future, then it just kind of helps marry those two things up together. And a lot of people don't realize that when I was um, playing, I was a competitive soccer player growing up playing top level amateur Canadian soccer, which is, you know, by Australian centers, not that high, but I would sit there in the huddle before every game. And while we're getting the pep talk from the captain, I'm just sitting there not paying attention, just visualizing myself in front of the net. My job was to score the goals. That was it. Visualizing one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Do I put it in the bottom right or the bottom left and just watching it go in constantly left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, header, header. 
And then come game time, when I'm sitting in that spot and I've got that opportunity to shoot, well, I'm not flustered now. It just seems to know. I've seen it go in the net three times in the in my head in the warm up. So I just execute what I had started with. And I ended up having a really high, I guess, finishing record amongst um, my peers. And so you translate that then into poker. If you're just coming to the final table of an event or level 10 or level two, it doesn't matter. If you visualize the result already happening on the other side of it, well, then it's just easier to get through that that mundane period or that boredom or whatever it is that you're going to get through because you take a bad beat. So what? I'm already going to hold the trophy at the end of this. <laughs> it's just part of my journey. And so that's that, for me, for me, the manifestation is key. Okay. So the manifest, manifestation, that's pretty common um, in our coaching field, the idea of visualization, especially when it comes to sport. Like, I don't think I know, like, you know, I like to watch on, you know, interviews and that with like professional athletes on YouTube and stuff. And like, almost every one of them have their own mental game coach. And it's always talking about visualization stuff. And like, I started looking into it and there was a study that they did with like basketball players and free throws. And they basically, basically got like a hundred um, people to do free throws and practice every day, like a hundred throws a day or something for like a month. And then the other ones had to mentally rehearse it. So they had to visualize it through meditation rather than actually physically throw the basketball. And there was only like a 1% differential uh, in by, by the end of this month with like the skill level um, f- from just half of them visualizing it and half of them actually doing it. So what they've proven is like you are actually firing neurons and in, in, in everything that are creating a skill. Uh, you know, it's like monkey see, monkey do. Like I'm a soccer player too. And I know that when I watch soccer, I see the body movements and everything and like the the passing sequences and everything. And then when I play, I'm like smarter from just watching it. It's ridiculous. Like, but that's mm-hmm. kind of what you're, you're referring to, right? This idea of like m- mentally rehearsing it before you get there, believing in it as well, which has a certain spiritual aspect and like, you know, confidence level. Like, I believe I can win it. So I can see it and I can map it out. Therefore, I expect to be, you know, get bad beats along the way because that's just normal. I expect to make mistakes, but I also expect to play great. Um, and you kind of like map out the realistic path to get there. So I'm kind of interested, like, of what your thoughts are on, well, okay, you've won a tournament before and, you know, maybe multiple ones and you've got lots of final tables and everything, right? So you've seen it and you've actually played it out. What about for someone who's never actually won a major tournament, who wants to win a major tournament? How can you, how can you visualize that and actually truly believe it if you've never actually done it? Great question. Um, I mean, it comes down to how can... How, when we're five years old, how do we sit there and, and somebody asks us, what do we want to be when we grow up? You know, you want to be a fireman or a police officer. And we're sitting there, we're acting it out the entire time. It's a, it's a real thing that we have uh, is the power of our own imagination. And as we get older, as adults, we drift from that and we lose that. So a lot of what I like to do, um, both myself and when I work with clients, is just through meditation Um, do a visualization exercise, you know, everyone's got this goal that they want to get to, well, let's plant ourselves in the future in that goal. And just smell it, feel it, hear it, see it, and just see where where it lands us. And it just starts to feel more real, even though it's, we're just creating it through our our imagination. Mm. And so just, yeah, just get there, just go yourself and just believe it. Yeah, I think like the power of our mind to actually create. Um, I think was something I heard was something like animals can't actually see into the future or the past, right? They have instinctual things like, you know, a dog that's been abused will know not to, you know, to pull back if someone's trying to pat them, but they don't know why or they, they can't remember why or, or anything. But humans, we have this like gift or curse, whichever way you want to look at it, where we can see into the future and we can also see into the past. Um, obviously we want to be living in the present as much as possible, but I think the idea of what you're talking about, when you talk about your senses, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but like when you do visualize yourself and you put yourself into the future, like holding the trophy and imagining, you know, being on the poker table and what it might feel like to touch the cards, to smell the, the casino, to hear the poker machines in the background, what you're doing is like, you're, um, predicting what you know to be there so that your brain has rehearsed that. And it, it might even have, let's say 10% extra capacity now and bandwidth 
to then process all the other information, which is constantly changing, right? So the way someone's playing against you or, you know, like emotion changes and all that, right? Like, is, is that what you're trying to say with the senses? I mean, that's definitely an aspect of it. Um, I probably lean stronger towards the, the path or the buildup. If we've gone to the future destination already, then all these struggles along the way that would normally be a, a, a limiting belief that we have that we can't get through this phase of the tournament is now just one stepping stone along the way because we've already experienced you know, what that, that event is going to feel like at the end and at the finish line. And so then you start bringing in some sort of adaptation skills and game plan skills ahead of time to, to map out how we're going to navigate our way through there, plus the visualization on the other end. And you've got this complete story that you're now well prepared around an entire event, whether it be at the poker table or whether it's something more um, serious in life that we're all working towards. Mm. Um, can be asking a girl out for the first time. You know, some of these the most nerve wracking things that we do as, as men or as human beings, you know, everybody can ask out the opposite sex. Uh, it's stupid nerve wracking, right? And yeah. uh, if you've practiced that before a couple of times, um, you know, walking up what you're going to say, it's so much easier. So yeah. everything, everything's related. Yeah, yeah. I like the, um, I forget who it was that I heard say this, but it was like, those who you know are real professionals, they, know, they don't know the difference between when they're practicing or, or actually performing. It's like the same because when they perform, they're practicing. And when they're practicing, they're performing. It's like mm -hmm. you can't tell the difference, right? I, I really like that. And so, so what you're saying is, I guess, like over time, like the more and more you just do something and if you can have that extra tool of the visualization pregame and, and you know, day, as a daily practice, then that's just having an edge over the field, right? And it's almost like, having an edge over your previous self, because then you can optimize your personal experience in life and poker and whatever it is you aspire to do. Um, that's, that's really cool. So that's, <laughs> we just spent like 10 minutes talking about one of those key aspects. <laughs> do you have two other key skills that you could say that you've been uh, using or you would say have, have got you these results? I think the, the second one um, that kind of sticks out the most for me is, when you have that visualization that you then turn into having more confidence. And when you have confidence, if you match that with at the poker table, some fearlessness as well. Um, fear is obviously the thing that is the biggest limiting belief that we have. It stops us and blocks us from doing everything that we want to be able to go out and do. And when we're at the poker table, if we're playing a tournament that is above our buy-in, that is, you know, we just automatically think, hey, this is, let's say for you and I, this is a five or a 10K buy-in, which is big for us. At least for me, it is. I'm going to sit there and just automatically assume, hey, these guys at this table and girls are more experienced than me. They must be better than me. They're used to playing these 5K events. What if I, you know, get knocked out in the first five minutes or, you know, all these worries that everyone has at whatever buy-in level is bigger than theirs. So for me, having won that Omaha event and then coming into the, the grind event, which was the $1,200 event in January, I decided that I was just going to play fearless. And if I thought that somebody was bluffing, screw it. I'm just going to call off my entire stack. Like I don't care because why not? And poker wasn't the goal. I wasn't trying to become a professional. I wasn't trying to, you know, be in the spotlight. I just wanted to play fearless poker. Mm -hmm. And I remember there's a couple spots. I ended up calling down, um, I'll leave the player out of this for, for just the story's sake, but I, I had pocket fives and, uh, there was, um, Jack, Jack rag flop after he three bet out of the small blind. And, um, I faced three barrels, um, and I ended up calling off an entire, um, chip stack. We were both chip leaders with about 40 left in the grind. And I just had fives and he had ace King. So ace high. And it was just because I went with my gut and my instinct and I was fearless, but had, I had been at all scared or thought about it for too long, I would have just made a fold and I would have preserved my chip stack. And I would have finished 15th in this tournament instead of second. Mm. And none of this would have unfolded for me. So fearlessness, if you can attain that state by having the visualization, by being confident, by playing among, you know, in within means of your bankroll um, and just trusting yourself, mm. that would be, a huge quality that everyone should take on board if they can. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky game when you start adopting that mentality because I 100% agree with you, but at the same time, there's so much variance in poker where you could have done the exact same thing you did, but maybe the guy got a king on the river and then, you know, you called off thinking, you know, he was bluffing and he was the whole way, but he got lucky, right? And then you lose it all, right? So, but was it a good or a bad play? And it's like, I always try and like work with my um, students to say like, you know, it's not about being good or bad. It's about what's more profitable or less profitable. Because if you start saying something's good or bad, then you're going to immediately start judging yourself. And mm. like judging yourself is only going to create more anxiety and fear and shame and doubt and everything, which is just not going to get you anywhere. Um, and that's kind of interesting with what you said about like, you know, coming in with this kind of fearless mentality, you've done your visualization, but on top of that, now you've got this, um, like it's almost like a careless attitude, but it's it's interesting because poker is so tough. And I think a lot of industries are like this where you have to care enough to the point where you also don't care enough because if you care too much, <laughs> then like you're overthinking things and like you get so emotionally like invested that when you bust out of the tournament, you, you're, you're upset and you're down. Um, but if you have the, you know, the carefree attitude, then, you know, maybe you don't play as well because you don't care as much. So how do you find the balance there? Like what, what does Mike Maddox do to find that balance between caring enough, but not caring too much? Yeah, I think it goes along the lines of what you just said with, you know, just not doing a good or a bad play. That's in the individual tournament. So we'll always be prepared for the tournaments that we come and play through meditation, through mindset, through game plan, through understanding the structure, who our opponents are. Then we're at the tournament, we're sitting down. And if you are just progressing through the tournament and you've got a game plan, well, then you should be playing the easy parts. You should be playing the right ranges of hands and you should be picking your spots appropriately. The variance is the side that you can't predict. And so when you're faced with a bad beat or you make a play that doesn't work out in your favor, then you do have to kind of just sit. And for me, what I do is, you know, I'm, I pride myself on being an intuition driven player. So mm -hmm. if I intuitively feel like that is the right decision at the time, I, I have to trust my intuition and I have to make that play. And it's not whether the play was good or bad or, or whether it was profitable or not profitable for me. It's just, did I trust my gut? Mm -hmm. And if I go that, that, that way, then I'm happy. And if my gut's wrong, um, oh, well, you know, maybe I have to, you know, retweak something and, and figure out what was it. Like, I remember I doubled you up in the last tournament we played in. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for that, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I legitimately thought that I had you on a hand that I could push you off of. And I had decided to call on the flop with nothing to play three streets to take it away from you. And that was it. Like, I went with my instincts. Um, and it was based on a, a live tell that I, I had a sample size of one on you. I had only seen it once before. And clearly, it wasn't that good because <laughs> it, it uh, was no longer accurate at that point. But I didn't beat myself up on it after the hand, you know, I, I probably gave away 35% of my stack to you. Um, and it, it was a pretty rough spot. If anybody had watching that on live stream, they would have been, what are you doing? I basically called you with ACE high on the flop turned second pair when you already had top pair and then proceeded to just jam on you. Um, and so after the hand is done, what I like to do in those situations is look, I trusted myself. I went with it. And I'm happy that I trusted myself. That's it. And then if I need to, if I'm feeling at all tilted, then chuck on some headphones, put in some meditation music, breathe deeply for 10 hands, recount my stack. How many big blinds do I have left? I have 35 big blinds. Fine. I'm absolutely fine. No problem. And I think I had like 50 big blinds after that. So it's, it's easy to stay in the right headspace. So yeah. the, I just kind of have this process that I go through around, do I trust myself? And then what are the motions? Where am I now moving forward? And just reset the mind. It's now nothing in the past matters. It's just moving forward in the tournament. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting that you bring up that scenario. Cause um, one thing I noticed in that situation and what I wanted to ask you this, because a, a lot of people come to me with like kind of issues around say tilt control or emotional regulation and things like that. Like, what do I do when things don't go my way? Or what do I do when I make a decision? And maybe in a nutshell, it didn't work out, but really I know it's actually a profitable play because, you know, you could have, you could have made that exact same play 
and maybe I was bluffing in, in, you know, maybe 50% of the time there, you, you are going to make money from that play, but it just so happens in, in this vacuum hand, uh, you ran into like a hand where I had something. And so again, it doesn't make it a good or a bad play. It's just like, okay, over time, I believe this to be profitable and that's my intuition. And I had a read and everything, but it didn't work out for me now, which is always like, it happens so often in poker, even when you win a tournament, like that happened to me when I won that tournament so many times over two days, you, you play a lot. You just got to hope that it doesn't happen as much as it does happen. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing I was curious about asking you was, in terms of a mindset thing. So you had a hand that didn't work out the way you wanted it to. Um, and then you, I noticed that you went really silent and you're saying that, you know, you put your meditation on everything because you're quite chatty on the table and, and interacted with, with players and, and that's part of your game. And I noticed you went silent. So is that what happens when, when, you know, when you something like that, that's unfavorable happens and you manage to reset? Yeah, it is completely. I think it's important to take the time to regroup and, I'm chatty most of the time because I'm comfortable at the table. And in that spot, it's my first priority becomes regrouping. And mm -hmm. just like we are habitual creatures and we have the most successes from creating habits, I have decided to create myself a habit around having a bad beat or making a losing a chunk of chips. It's basically anytime a monumental pot happens, whether it's for or against me, I could have just doubled up in the tournament. I still have to reset myself because I don't want to spray chips at this point and give anything away. And then vice versa. I don't want to give any chips away because I'm tilted. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just really a series of things that I, I go through. It's in a couple deep breaths, it's count how many big blinds I have left and then just say, okay, what's my strategy. And that's it. Yeah. And, and sometimes it takes 30 seconds and sometimes it takes five minutes and a, a walk around the tournament room before yeah. I come back. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, I, I was really impressed by that. And like, you know, in my experience over 13 years of playing, I've seen so many people just start just tilting off chips and just like they lose their emotions and, and their stack along, along with it. Right. Um, and so I was very impressed to see that not, not surprised, but certainly impressed when somebody can have that not go their way and then still maintain it. Cause um, as you mentioned earlier, um, sometimes you're going to have these hands where it's, it's questionable by like the game theory standards, but you had an instinct and you had a read and then, you know, and sometimes like in live poker, people have this fear of being judged by others because 10 other people see it, or maybe it's on a live stream and, and hundreds of other people see it. Um, and that's also the same fear that holds them back from doing these types of plays, but really mm -hmm. that's how you win tournaments. I mean, like I, I'm saying it firsthand, you're saying it firsthand, but sometimes it doesn't go your way and you need to be able to manage that. Right. And so, yeah, so, so I was really impressed to see that. So, um, and then, yeah, like you just continued on um, and played your game and, and, you know, you still finished with a decent chip stack after day one and, and, you know, you carried on, which is great. Mm -hmm. So moving on here, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you've kind of mentioned a little bit about it, but like, what is it exactly about poker that really attracts you? Like, I mean, I think it's quite synonymous to other things in life, but like, what is it to you that poker really stands out for you rather than, I mean, soccer, like, as you said, you used to play soccer or whatever. I mean, if I could play competitive soccer and make it a living and be able to pay for stuff, <laughs> then I would do that ultimately. But that's a very small percentage of people in the world. I guess it's also a small percentage of the people in the world who can do it with poker. Um, the thing with poker is it's just, it's so stimulating in so many ways. And for me, it's this hodgepodge coming together of psychology and getting inside the mind and, you know, battling your own mind and then applying these strategic tactics and it's just mental warfare against other people. And there's, there's no other time or place that you can get that. Um, not to that, that level where you're just battling somebody one-on-one -on -one, heads up, you know, in a pot. I just, you're just trying to rip these pots away from people. <laughs> it's just, it's just this war of attrition over and over and over again. And I don't know, it, it's just really hard not to love the game. I don't think there's anything specifically about it. That's, that makes poker anything better than anything else. But for me, it's, it just pulls me in because I feel like all of the, the things that I'm really good at my intuition and my mathematical skills and my quick thinking ability and my reading ability all kind of come together 
and my love of cards. And they just formed this one game that happens to be something that's popular. So mm. for me, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. I'm curious yeah, though. Like, what, what is it for you? Cause I haven't yeah. asked you that before for me yeah no look I, i'm kind of similar like I, I my story would be more like i grew up in a family with um four brothers and a sister and uh being i'm the second youngest and so like when there's six of you running around we're basically all competing for mom and dad's love and attention and so if it's not that it's the love and attention of you know we had like you know 20 or 30 cousins on each side of our mom and dad's side and then you know like schools were big and we all played sports and it was constantly just like a competitive environment in our household like even when we we're trying to play nintendo we had four controllers to play nintendo and there's five boys trying to trying to fight to play and my <laughs> sister who also liked to play as well so it's like you know like if you're out of the game you have to sit there and watch if you lose so it's like when you're in it you got to play well so you can stay in the game um so my main influence probably would, would, would come from that or the competitive influence comes from growing up in a, fa- in a big family. Um, and also, yeah, like my dad was a big sort of soccer player as well. And so like we all grew up playing soccer and um, I started playing chess when I was in um, school as well. And then after that, I, I got into music. So there's the creative side. The only um, subject I was good at was maths um, and music, uh, but I was horrible at like English, science, geography. You can forget about all that. Like I, I told you before this podcast started, I had to relearn how to or learn how to write an essay at 25 years old because I left school <laughs> early. So for me, like what I love about poker is that it does challenge me on so many different levels. It's competitive, it's intellectual, um, you know, it, it's it's sort of like a way to get out aggression in a controlled environment as well. Because I think that's something where like, I would be normally probably attracted to something like boxing or, or UFC fighting. But if you can see me, I'm a twig. Yeah. I would get snapped in half. And so oh, like, you and I'm me both. Terif- yeah, right. <laughs> so like, but when we're on the poker table, like I could play against someone who's like a hundred kilos and just like ripped and I could completely tear him apart. And actually that's happened multiple times. And then they get angry at me and start verbally abusing me because, you know, <laughs> some punk kid who's like half my, half his size is beating him. So look, I, I love it because it's such an even ground to, to everybody comes to this poker table. You all start with the same amount of chips. Like I was never a cash game player. I, I really focus on tournaments and love tournaments because it is like that. You know, it's it's like life, man. Like we, we all get born into this thing and like you all get dealt hands and some of them are luckier than others and it's what you do with it that matters and and even if you make the right decisions life can still go pretty horribly for you and then you just have to become resilient so i read a really cool article recently it was about a woman who wanted to teach her five-year-old daughter how to play poker because she truly believed that all the skills you'd learn from it could like set you up for like being just such a resilient fighter in life and she's not Mm. wrong like you know you have to learn how to you know, even if you get the best possible hand, which is of course pocket aces, you're still going to lose with them at a pretty high rate. So like in life, you could be dealt some cool situations and it doesn't always hold strong for like forever, you know, things are impermanent. And so like, I just love that it's just so perfectly represents life and it's just made me stronger and more resilient within my relationships, within my journey, within just everything, man. Like, and, but even now, man, like, I, I think I still like life's a struggle and, and I hate this like false idea that social media and everything sets up where everyone's doing well and all that. And really not everyone's doing well. Right. Like I've had some results recently and that's great, but it's like, that's not the true story. No one knows how much people were staking me into it. No one knows if I had any, maybe I had some debt or maybe I was, you know, sick during it all. Like no one knows the true story. And so like, what I want to say is I want to normalize the fact that everyone who's whether, whether it looks like you're doing well or not, everyone is in life in this like sort of similar um, journey and everyone's just at different stages of it. And so like, I want to be raw. I want to be real. And that's what I like about you, Mike, because you, you have that about you as well. Um, And so poker has this great, um, I don't know, like stage where it brings people together of all different, you know, types and walks of life. I think in, in other sports like soccer or something, they're all kind of similar because, you know, mm-hmm. like if you go and play at the World Cup or something, it's all these young 20-year-olds who have had the same journey where they've had to train since they were five years old and they've got over-competitive parents and, you know, it's all about the money and, like, poker is so different to that, right? Like, you, I, I've met some incredible people on my journey, journey in poker. So Yeah. 
And I guess in that facet too, it's the only game where you can legitimately be an amateur playing your first hand of poker and sit down with a player like Phil Helmuth if you want to, if you've got the bankroll for it. Like there's no other sport in the world where you can just sit down and and play with the pros. You know, mm-hmm. that that famous saying that some of those online sites gave us back in the day. That's it's it's so true. And I think for me, that was the coolest thing. And I guess now we're starting to kind of find our way on the other side of it, where were some of the um, more recognizable names within the Australian poker scene. And I love to be able to play with everybody. You know, I don't necessarily have time to play all the smaller buy-in events, but if people want to come and sit down in the the super high rollers, you know, the one K buy-in events, then or satellite in. Yeah. Great. Let's play. Like let's, let's literally play against the best and have some yeah. fun. And yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. I do have a question for you that we didn't, um, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you at all. So I'm curious how to catch you off guard with this. You, you talk about being raw. One thing I have wondered whether this was something that was specific to me or not in my relationships that stems from poker, I felt. You talked about a lot of the resilience that you you um, you gather up specifically through poker. And I'm, I agree wholeheartedly. Sometimes I wonder, does that cause you to emotionally close off a little bit? Because we're used to not reacting so much, taking a bad beat or not getting as super excited when we win a hand. So therefore in life, when something really exciting happens with your partner or something really bad happens, we just kind of are less emotional about it. Do you ever notice that happening or creeping into your life at all? When I was younger, yeah, definitely. Uh, like, you know, in my early 20s, I think like I, I didn't have enough balance. Um, it wasn't until I was about 25 where I went through a rough patch where I was came out of a big relationship and then had a bit of a soul searching trip around Central America. And then I came back and enrolled in the course. And it just so happened to be that the course I enrolled in was, you know, counseling and coaching. So it's all to do with learning how to basically help mental health and and how, how to control your emotions and, and all that. So I would say that when I was younger, I, I had issues with that and differentiating things. Um, and I think a lot of people do struggle with that because it's almost like, oh, if I win the tournament, I shouldn't really be happy because I, sh- you know, I expect to win because I'm, you know, here to win. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it's like, if you, it's what I said earlier, it's like, you, you can't care too much or not enough, right? You have to find that middle ground. And so I, I'm very different outside of the table uh, than when I am when I'm in the game, as you might have noticed. Like when I'm on the table, like what what would you say my presence is on the table? Um, you've got a, a ridiculously calm demeanor in every single situation that you play. Um, almost robotic, I would say at times. Um, but you're just comfortable in in most of the scenarios. I. I legitimately remember the first time we played together at APT and um, we just played some hands, but I knew who you were because somebody told me little birdie on my shoulder. And um, I just wanted to outplay you one hand just to see what would happen. And, and, and I just made a play at a pot and you just surrendered it and were unaffected, completely unaffected by it. I was like, Oh, okay, fair enough. And that was it. Like that was the, the test that I had. And um, I saw that there was a lot of resilience there behind yeah. the scenes. I didn't know too much else other than that. So yeah. Yeah. So like, that's uh, what I would say. Okay. So that's interesting. So like my presence is really more just like chill. It seems like I'm just kind of robotically making decisions and like that's from 13 years of playing poker and not just playing, but also working on my mental game with my own coach earlier. And then now also with just a lot of like studying and everything as well. Um, And so now I think if you were to ask my friends or my family, what I'm like, it's very different. It's not like calm, robotic, like, you know, straight face it's like i'm i'm really you know well at least i try my best to at all times be present for them um, i'm very inquisitive and in, and and i'm always like um reaching out and asking questions and i'm like my emotional intelligence is much is really quite high i would say that's like i've done those character trait things and that seems to always come out at the top so mm-hmm. for me like over years and years though that's where i'm at now and maybe if you ask me in five years time it might be different again right because so many things can change and and either strengthen you or, or make you weaker. And, but right now I, th- I would say that's where I'm at, but it's, it's a good question. Cause I think a lot of people would struggle with that. Yeah. And probably um, similar story to you as I'm getting older in my mid thirties, as I'm like, what we say growing up now, right. Looking for kind of that, that long-term partner in a lot of those situations and you just becoming an adult and priorities are changing. 
I think that it's similar in, in that way. And I'm just, yeah, more open off the table and it's probably more, uh, not so much of, I used to relate it to, Hey, we have a bad beat and we just don't feel it. Or we have a win and we just don't feel it. And so you go outside and you just, you know, don't feel these things, but it's, it's about feeling it because it sucks to have a bad beat or it sucks or it's great to, to have a win. Um, but then, you know, having those systematic processes to then deal with it and, yeah. and reset and regroup. And so I guess in life, I've started learning and probably over the last five years to feel these things again. And that was, that was an interesting journey for me. And I'm, you know, I, I cry when I watch too many movies now, so it's, <laughs> I'm feeling everything and it's, yeah. it's beautiful. Cause that's, that's what life should be about, you know, being in touch with our emotions and going there and, and digging them out and, and being free from those things that instead of just avoiding them all the time. Yeah. So. Man. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you. Cause I think like one thing I help people with as well is like accepting the idea of losing because really you, you are going to lose more often than you'll win. And what I would say is like, you don't watch a movie, especially like a, a drama movie, just for it to be completely happy and a straight run up. And then you feel great at the end of it. It's like, no, no, you have to be introduced to the characters and then you have some dips and things happen and there's challenges. And then, you know, they always bring you out on a high. And it's like with, with like tournaments, that's, that's the drama. The drama is that you're not going to win every hand. You are going to dip and peak and dip you know, like enjoy the process, feel the process. Otherwise you're, mm -hmm. you're not actually like a human being, right? Like you're not getting that human experience. So that's why I think emotional regulation is way better than emotional, uh, like avoidant avoidance. So like ignoring it. And that's where your meditation, as we can, we've done a full loop back to like the meditation <laughs> stuff where you really just can like embrace your journey, embrace what's mapped out for you and enjoy that journey and use your deep breathing to regulate during those situations where things don't go, always go to plan. Um, yeah. And I think that that can often help, you know, it's not even just about like getting you to like succeed better. It's just about getting you to actually have more balance and to be able to enjoy the process better. Um, so that, you know, when you, every time you sit down and play poker or do whatever, whatever it is you want to do, you enjoy the process and mm -hmm. you're not as like ruined if it doesn't go well or, but it's a good question, man. It's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. So, yeah. um, okay. So let's moving on, man. We're just for the last like five or 10 minutes or so. Um, what, what's one of the like biggest obstacles that you've found in your clients that you've worked with when you're, when you're coaching, um, this could be poker related or, or outside of poker up to you, but what would you say is the biggest thing that they commonly struggle with when it comes to achieving goals? I think there's two things and I'm going to kind of loop myself into, into one of these as well. Um, the first one is a lot of people seemingly think that they're coming to me for poker coaching. And then we get halfway into our first session together and we realize, well, they realize that they're now talking about a lot of events that are occurring off the felt outside of the table that are then influencing and affecting their game on the table. So I think, and this is where I have found a lot of success for myself recently too, is just tightening the screws a little bit on some of the habits outside of the game, you know, finding a consistent time to go running, doing a walk first thing in the morning when you wake up, water fasting um, throughout that until you eat at lunchtime, whatever your schedule is, whatever works for you, you know, find those habitual things that work to make sure that you are setting yourself up the best way you can for, for life. And a lot of the clients that I work with, um, yeah, they'll, they'll kind of not have their screws tight in all those other areas and they'll have commitment issues around or, you know, focus issues or determination issues. And we kind of just find ways to tweak those off the felt. And then all of a sudden it just translates back into the game. Mm. Um, and then the other side of it is almost undoubtedly, most of my clients all have um, some sort of confidence issue at the mm. table. So just assuming that everyone else is more accomplished than them or everyone is better than they are. Um, this was my biggest weakness when I started playing any buy-in that was outside of my normal range. My first $2,000 buy-in that I played, uh, I think it was probably back in 2014. I did not cash it. I probably lasted an hour and a half. And um, I remember sitting down um, next to Dean Blatt and he was, he had, knocked me out of the 
the six max tournament, uh, maybe a few days before. And I finished fourth for, I think 14,000. That was my biggest result on Hended mob, but it was a bad beat and it should have been 50 K for the win. You know, all these things that we tell ourselves constantly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. You want to hear another bad beat story, man? Yeah. Yeah. yeah go one. for it. Yeah. I'll just stop the recording. <laughs> so, you know, fast forward three days, I'm now sitting down at this, the main event, which was, I think a 2.6 K buy-in or 2.2, something like that. And I've got Dean Blatt on my table and there's a couple other pros. And I just automatically assume that these pros are just going to know when I'm weak and going to know when I'm strong. And they're three betting me because I don't have it. And like, I realized they're just playing their cards. And so trying to give them um, a bigger pedestal than they deserve. They're just a human being. They're just playing their cards. Um, that's the challenge that I found. And I've seen that in a lot of my, my clients as well. They're just automatically assuming that everybody is um, more deserving of being there than they are and more likely to win than they are. And where, where does that come from though? Like, let, let's go one step deeper for a moment. Mm. I mean, I think it comes from different places from everybody. So it comes from a lack of experience first and a lack of results for them. Um, but yeah, just it's, I find the things that I work through with clients when they have that, um, that issue popping up is just to kind of open the door a little bit for them and just show them who, who they are playing against. Like, mm. how much have you analyzed the table that you're sitting down with? Have you actually looked up their hand in mobs? You know, you might see them all the time, but just see how many career caches they have. You know, are they really that further ahead than you? Mm. Uh, a lot of these different um, tools to just make them more human. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of other issues that, that people carry with them um, on the felt through childhood experiences or whatever it may be, lacking yeah. confidence and just not having the self-preparation. Uh, but that, that becomes a whole other type of counseling and, and coaching that we would work through. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that's where, like, I, I truly believe like the core of most of these issues, like um, from, you know, my experience in both counseling and coaching it tends to always come back to this childhood stuff and also just like, you know, like family dynamics and everything and, and, and this cry for attention or help or the need to be seen or heard or, you know, whatever it might be. And so it tends to actually come out in people's poker games. So with, with people I work with quite often when, like you mentioned, like they come to you thinking that they're going to get all these tips and strategies on how to win at the game, like from a fundamental point of view, but really it's all in here. And it's like, you know, in terms of like a, a mindset thing, by the way, not not like, you know, the mental fundamental stuff. And so like, yeah, I, I find that like, yeah, like pe people often have to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you end up like flipping over from coaching into almost, yeah, counseling. And it's like, yeah, which then it starts to become like, I would outsource and say, well, that's something you should probably go and see a psychologist about, you know, because if you really want to make serious change, I believe once you get deeper and deeper and deeper, you'll start realizing that the reason why you're afraid of other people in a poker game is because you're afraid of something way back that you never actually addressed. And so mm -hmm. people carry this stuff and, you know, we can keep going down that portal, but like, I'll hold it up there, but it's, that's when we start manifesting illness and like pain and all that stuff. Cause our bodies will carry it as well. Um, so, but anyway, that's for another podcast and another day. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, man. Like, so, um, okay. So let's, let's, uh, start seg segueing out of this. So, um, what's one piece of advice that you would give to, to listeners like who, who are looking to achieve the most in their either poker career or any other career? Like what's one little gem you could leave them with? I think um, the easiest things to take on, uh, we, we have to start incorporating new habits and kind of changing who we are, not just what we do, but the belief of who we are. So we start to believe who we are when we become someone new with new habits, mm -hmm. the easiest habits to bring on, and the healthiest ones, water intake, hands down, the most successful thing. If you can pair proper water intake more than you think you should, you should drink, get a, a, a bottle of water that you can guzzle water down, refill it at the tap constantly, and then pair that with good sleep. So if you're well rested, then you, those two things will allow you so much more space and energy to move into anything else that you want. You'll feel more adept at making your bed in the morning. You'll feel better at jumping into your to-do list, all these little things. So if you just want to focus on two little, little bits, it's for me, it's water and sleep. 
Nice, man. Yeah. And I think I'd add one that to that, which would be just exercise and body movement, which you said earlier in the, in the, in the episode. So like, mm -hmm. um, I think those three, like really changing your physiology and your chemi chemical makeup almost like with that sleep and water and, and movement and fresh air, like that should come way more like primary before any other like plans of, of anything coming to play. Right. That way you've got what it takes to actually do what you aspire to do rather than trying to like, basically, you know, drive 150 miles an hour on an empty gas tank, right? It's, you're never going to get anywhere. So love exactly. that, man. Um, well, thanks so much for your time today. So um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing a lot of your wisdom and, and stuff that goes on behind the curtains for, for Mike Maddox. And uh, yeah, if anyone wanted to like um, reach out to you or, or get in touch with you, um, what sort of services do you offer and how can they find you? So right now, uh, easiest way to find me is um, you can go to my website. It's actually just getting released probably around the same time as this podcast does. Um, nice. MaddoxMindset.com.au. I'll probably just get MaddoxMindset.com anyway, but um, that's the easiest way to find me. What I do is I work with people one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I don't do group sessions or um, trying to stay away too much from getting into a big classroom session. I just work with people one-on-one -on -one and I really help them um, find that next step that next pathway, just open that up for them and then let them explore that. Um, there's three modalities that I, I work with or three kind of genres that I kind of specialize in. And that's performance and mindset first. Um, I do spiritual guidance as well. Um, they're kind of intertwined themselves. And then poker coaching um, seems to be the major draw card, of course, for a lot of people too. So within those, it's all amalgamated together. And we work um, in that one-on-one -on -one setting. And it's great. What I do is, um, three month commitments when I sign up with somebody. So we, we don't just do single sessions and then we say goodbye forever. It's, you know, a three month commitment. We work through some challenges and then we come out on the other side, having smashed through a lot of those goals. So that's the, that's how I would describe it. Yeah. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. I find that like, I've had people where you just have one session and that's it. And then they expect some sort of like dramatical change. It's like things take time. And if you're in it for the short, like quick fix, like there's, there's no quick fix basically is the answer. So yeah. So I love that, man. Well, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Good luck uh, as you play the next bunch of tournaments that are coming up for you. And uh, hopefully we can do this a uh, little bit more frequently and keep that conversation up around uh, just like, you know, taking care of ourselves, trying to get the most out of life as well as the most out of poker, which we both love. So um, yeah, thanks so much, man. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. I think it was fantastic. And I'd love to come back on your show and do it again. And um, I love how you say that. Let's get more out of life. That's it, man. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Thanks. Yeah.